Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Danielle Davis, and I'm going to be coordinating things on the back end of the event. If you have any questions, um, then feel free to place those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will have a designated time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so for those of you that are new to the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, we're a center here in Ann Arbor in a collaboration between the University of Michigan, Wayne State, and Michigan State University. We offer a variety of dementia-related research studies, and so if you're interested in learning more about our wellness, wellness programs for caregivers, Lewy Body Dementia Support Groups, or if you want to get involved with research, then feel free to visit our website, social media, or reach out to me and I can point you in the right direction. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Benjamin Hampstead joined the UM faculty in September 2014 as an associate professor in psychiatry and staff neuropsychologist in the Ann Arbor VA healthcare system. He's the clinical core leader at the MADRC. Dr. Hampstead is an expert in functional imaging and non-pharmacological approaches to enhance age-related memory function. So through his appointment in the Ann Arbor VA healthcare system, he is well positioned to ensure that our older veterans have access to cutting edge research and clinical procedures. So um, before you start going, Ben, could you go to the next slide for me? All right, so just so everyone um, is aware, we are recording and there will be a recording available at the end of the presentation on our YouTube page. And we will have an evaluation that you'll receive that we're asking you to fill out. Also, I will put the link for the evaluation in the chat box as soon as we're done. So if you wanna take some time today, it's just a few quick questions that we ask you to um, please fill out. And next slide. All right, and then we have our upcoming presentation that will be May 26, and Dr. Kelly Bukowski will be presenting. So if you're interested in um, learning about that presentation, then you're also able to register for that to attend for next month. So without further ado, um, Dr. Hampstead, you can take it away. All right, well, thanks so much. And thanks to, to all who have uh, been able to join us today. I think it's uh, a little bit different doing things over Zoom as opposed to being able to interact in an actual 3D person space. Um, but this is also kind of nice because you get to, to tune in from wherever you're at. And I see that uh, we have a growing list of people, I think, currently up to about 138. So um, really wonderful to be here. And I hope that everybody is, is taking care of yourselves and doing well. Um, in these, you know, uh, pretty challenging, strange times. And, and I think one of the things that I'm excited to be able to share with you today are some of the things that we're doing um, to help try and improve some of the, the thinking or cognitive abilities, as I'll say, um, without using medications. And so I'm going to give you kind of a broad brush overview of, of a number of different areas, some of which my group uh, and I specialize in, others that to colleagues at the university or elsewhere uh, are doing. So I think they'll, they'll be kind of a nice mix of things that uh, you know, we can talk about uh, toward the end. Before we get there, um, I do want to acknowledge uh, that I have no conflicts of interest. I, I, nobody's paying me millions of dollars. I keep looking for those endorsement deals and you know they're just not coming. So I want to make sure to <clears throat> acknowledge the Department of Veteran Affairs and the National Institute on Aging. They've, they've really supported this line of work. We have a number of grants um, through the VA that I've listed, as well as um, some ongoing and new grants through the National Institute on Aging um, that really have helped drive this field of, of the non-pharmacologic or non-medication uh, intervention work forward. And of course, the, the huge uh, partnership with the Alzheimer's Center here that, that brought us all together. And I think um, the combination of these efforts is wonderful because the, the Alzheimer's Center is really doing a number of cutting edge um, studies to help identify the causes and early detection associated with uh, cognitive loss during the, the lifespan. And then where my group comes in, is more focusing on the what do we do now? 
how can we try and improve some of these cognitive abilities, these thinking abilities? Um, how can we help people um, perform as well as they can in their everyday lives? So we have a range of ongoing studies that um, I, I've included some of the jargony, geeky logo here or language here that uh, the cognition oriented treatments, neuromodulation, and then exercise. So there are a number of things that I'll cover with each of these. I'll, I'll be sure to, to give you more information about, gosh, what do these, these kind of jargony terms actually mean? So as we think about the, the overall view of what we'll be spending the next roughly 40 or so minutes covering, we're gonna focus on what the literature tells us. What does the science tell us about the effects of exercise, about some of those cognition-oriented treatments that I mentioned? or about the neuromodulation. And I'll do my best not to dive too far down into the, the weeds with some of the, the evidence of the brain changes, but there are some you know, pretty cool uh, findings that I'll, I'll try and relay to you um, so that we can kind of get a sense of, gosh, it's not just some black box. We're actually able to change the brain even in the face of things like Alzheimer's disease. So this figure to the right is important for us as we think about where people fall in the, the kind of span, the, the dementia continuum. Because you have on this leftmost box here, normal, quote unquote, cognitive functioning, normal, healthy aging, where people are doing well, their thinking abilities are basically more or less where they should be and where they've, they've been traditionally, and where people are still functioning well in their everyday life. This middle box is termed mild cognitive impairment or MCI. And MCI is kind of the step where you're starting to see some, some changes in our thinking abilities, our cognitive abilities. The most frequently reported are difficulty learning and remembering new information. But importantly, during this MCI stage, people are still doing pretty darn well in their everyday life. Many people are still very, very active in the community. It, they may have jobs, and they haven't really seen the impact of those cognitive changes on their everyday life. Whereas then once we transition into the dementia stage, people now have the cognitive deficits that were there during MCI, but now are having difficulty performing the things in everyday life that you would normally do. And this can range from, you know, some mild inconveniences to then more in the late stages, really needing a lot more care. And I think that keeping this continuum in mind is really important and, and something that I'm happy to talk more about, but you'll see that I, I kind of highlight the research in each of these different categories. So I think that's hopefully going to be helpful so that we know and we're able to kind of compare whether the benefits are there in one versus another or just across the continuum. Before I jump into the intervention work, I think it's always helpful to, to take a step back and think about why might we be experiencing change in our thinking abilities as we age. Now these, uh, you'll see, I've said this, these can be real or perceived changes, right? Because some of them are real, some of them are based on our own perceptions. And if we're, and I'll come back to it in a minute, but if we're stressed, we're more likely to perceive that we're having greater difficulty, even though our abilities may be just fine. So the first component of these changes is normal aging. So what is normal aging? Well, there have been a number of studies that have looked across the lifespan and, and still ongoing work following people for decades on end. And what you can see, this figure here that my cursor is moving over is from Salthouse and colleagues. Now this is you know, already 10, 11 years old, but it's, it's pretty much the, the classic finding where there are certain cognitive abilities that start to decline once we get into our 30s. And then they just kind of show this regular steady decline across the lifespan. Whereas other abilities, things like our our knowledge of vocabulary and the information about the world. Once we have it, generally speaking, we have it. So that doesn't change, but the things that are declining are things that, that require a lot more um, perhaps attention, the speed with which we're able to process information, 
how flexible we are with our thinking. So those things we know show this kind of steady decline over the lifespan, and that's just part of aging. So there are these cognitive changes, there are changes within the structure of the brain and how the brain is functioning. Now, experience and habits play a role here because they can be both good and bad. The more times we do something, the better we are at it, and that's regardless of where we're at in our lifespan. But sometimes having these habits can work against us, right? And so I just talked about being able to, to think more flexibly and to, to try different things. But if we've been doing something for 40, 50, 60 years, the same way more or less, we may not be really primed to think about how to do things a little bit differently. So all of these things though are part of normal aging. And, you know, certainly if I look back to where I was in, in college, I have this very salient memory where I was watching ESPN Sports Center. I was on the phone with my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and I was studying all at the same time and I wasn't missing a beat. Now, if one child is talking to me, another chimes in, the dog runs by and the TV is on, I can't handle it. And so I have to tell them stop, stop, stop one at a time. And again, that's just kind of a normal part of aging. So on top of normal aging, we then have things, psychological and social factors that are really important. And as we age, there's certainly a change in our life roles where you may go from boss to retirement, from parent to needing care. As part of that, there's also loss and grief, family, friends, getting sick, passing away. These things take certainly take a toll. There are also expectations where you may know some folks that, that kind of have these self-fulfilling prophecies. Oh, I'm getting old, I can't do this anymore. Well, that certainly creates a mindset where then maybe we don't try to do things even though we could do them. But if we think we can't do them, we're not likely to do it. And then that can interact with some of these um, more emotionally laden factors where we start to, to get upset about being older. There are also altered opportunities, less social interaction, and especially this past year with being in, in quarantine for most of the last year, certainly our social interactions are not as robust as, as they could be. And so this is important because we know that being socially active, engaging with people, having to read the body language, having to express ourselves, having to process what people are saying, that's a very complex, tricky task. And if we don't have that opportunity, that can also interact with some of these things. And finally, of course, stress. I had to put this on. The last year has, has been challenging between COVID the contentious election, social movements um, on all sides of the, the political spectrum. These things create this sense of, of environmental stress that are really challenging for us. And I, I'll stick with the stress theme for a minute because we know that this can interact with some of these normal changes in our thinking abilities and in, in the way our brain is working. And so, for example, some of the stress, the hormones that we secrete when we're stressed, have been suggested to specifically target areas of the brain that are critical for being able to learn and remember new information. So if these areas are already a little bit weaker, just with normal aging, and then we add on stress, gosh, that's, that's kind of uh, setting us up for, you know, kind of a, a, not a great situation. Stress can also interact with medical conditions. And so the medical conditions certainly by themselves can contribute to cognitive change. The ones that we often look at are what we'll term vascular risk factors. So how well is the blood within our body flowing and especially getting up to our brain? Things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol and diabetes. Those are the, the things that we often refer to as the vascular triad because they tend to hang together. And we know that they can affect how well the blood is flowing through our body and, and getting the oxygen and the nutrients to our brain. Sleep is another big one. 
certainly I've lost sleep in the past year. I'm willing to bet many of you have as well. Is this because of stress? How does it interact with vascular conditions? Is it part of normal aging? All of these things come together. And when we think about the confluence of the, the combination of all these different factors, that's where we can then start to think about the brain injuries and, and the brain disease. And in this case, I'm gonna focus on dementia specifically. Now dementia, I think one important point that I wanna drive home is dementia is an umbrella. It's an umbrella term. Even though many people think Alzheimer's equals dementia, Alzheimer's is one type of disease that can lead to dementia. And so remember what I said a couple of slides ago about dementia being cognitive problems, changes in our cognitive abilities, and no longer being able to function well in everyday life. Those two things are what creates the syndrome of dementia. Now, if you think about the umbrella being the term dementia, one of the key components is that vascular, how much blood is flowing to our brain. So I put the vasculars as kind of, if there's no blood flowing to the brain, it can't function. So I put that as the handle of the, the umbrella. But if you think about the spokes that compose the umbrella, we have the different types of diseases that can ultimately lead to dementia. And this is what I wanted to emphasize that Alzheimer's is one of these spokes. Parkinson's disease is another spoke. Lewy body disease is another spoke. Huntington's is another spoke and so on. There are a number of, of uh, conditions that can lead to dementia. So I wanted to keep that in mind because when I talk about um, dementia today, I'll be talking this more broad stroke, this all-cause dementia that, that is really just referring to this umbrella. There can be many different reasons for it, but I wanted to, to make sure to convey that uh, before we go forward. So knowing that all these things can impact us and impact our functioning, what can we do about it? Well, the first thing that we'll jump into is exercise. Newsflash, exercise is good for us. It has multiple beneficial effects. The medical conditions that I just talked about, not that I'll come back to in a minute. Mental health, it, there's evidence that it can reduce symptoms of depression. It can reduce anxiety and, and some of that feeling of stress. And then again, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the cognitive benefits it can have. It increases the structure and the function of our brain. How, it gets the brain bigger. It helps the brain communicate better. A couple of important things, greater physical activity, people who are more physically active have better cognitive functioning across the lifespan. So if you take people who are very active versus people who are not active, the people who are active tend to have much better cognitive and thinking abilities. And exercise can reduce the risk of dementia. And again, it's that general umbrella term of dementia, but fewer than 5% of adults get the recommended amount, which is, is 30 minutes a day. And so I'm sure uh, I know that, that my own exercise equipment has certainly looked this way in the past. Um, and, you know, we, we tend not to prioritize it all too often because we have 8 million other things going on in our lives. And, you know, a lot of times exercise will take the hit. So, as part of that, there's, there's a big knowledge. We all know we should be exercising, but we're not. So there's that knowledge versus action gap. There's the motivation to get out and to do it. There's the cost associated with doing it, not just the financial cost of either owning your own equipment or having a gym membership, but many times people feel like, what am I giving up in order to go hit the gym? That's coming at a, a cost of my own time or my other interactions that are important to me. And then perhaps not knowing how best to exercise. And these are all factors that kind of limit how much we do it. So there are two primary questions that I'll just give you the take home message now. Does exercise reduce the risk of developing dementia? Yes, and I highlighted that up above here. And does it improve cognition or thinking abilities? I have that being a yes slash maybe because there's a little bit of nuance here that it's, it's not as cut and dry. And so there are some important things that again, toward the end of the talk, I'm happy to, to circle back to. 
Um, but generally speaking, there is evidence that exercise can improve our thinking abilities. So one of the, the ways that we can conceptualize exercise is aerobic, right? So, and this is typically, you know, we think about jogging or rowing or doing an elliptical or a bike, things that keep our heart rate up for sustained periods of time. Now, in the studies that have been done, they've typically had people do three to six or more months of exercise. So it's not just a, a once a week, it's not just a one time, you have to do it and you have to keep doing it to see the benefits. But this is when the studies that have done this have shown this improvement in executive abilities. So remember those things that I showed kind of going down in an almost a straight line um, with age? Well, some of those things can actually be improved. That planning, um, the inhibitory control. So if we don't want to do something, it's that ability not to do something. So perhaps putting our foot in our mouth at the wrong time of um, moving or, or doing something too impulsively, we're better able to control that. And then that multitasking that I gave you that example for me, um, that also has been shown to get better in at least some groups. Now, why? Well, the neuroimaging, so the brain imaging that we can do, has shown that these prefrontal and parietal areas here that I have in green, these areas get bigger and they communicate better, okay? There's also another area that's really, really important when we think about learning and memory, and that's the hippocampus. And you can see that I have half of the brain, you're looking through a person's head, this is half of the brain, and then here's the hippocampus in the side of the brain that I removed, and then the hippocampus in the side of the brain that I kept in. So you can see it's a pretty small structure, but the hippocampus is really critical for learning and remembering new information. This is also one of the main areas that diseases like Alzheimer's disease attacks early in the disease course. And that's why we have the, the memory deficits that characterize Alzheimer's. So exercise has been shown to improve hippocampal functioning. And one of the early studies that I'll show you just to, to kind of let you see that, that I um, have evidence behind me, Erickson and colleagues randomized people to either an aerobic exercise or a stretching toning control group. So you can see that then the volume of these different brain areas, they measured them at, at the start of the study, six months in and one year after starting the exercise program or the stretching toning program. And you can see that the blue line is the exercise and the groups are no different in any of these brain areas at the start of the study, right? But what happens in the hippocampus? The group receiving the aerobic exercise, their hippocampi get bigger, both the left and the right get bigger. The group who's in the stretching and toning shows what is actually a normal age-related decline in this particular brain area. Whereas other brain areas that are less likely to change with age, you really don't see any difference between the two groups, right? So we know that this can help fight off some of those quote unquote normal age-related changes just by exercising for, like I said, uh, roughly a year here. Now, one of the, the big things that I've, I've talked a lot about is the blood flow right? Getting the blood to our brain because in the blood are the nutrients and the oxygen that our brain needs to work. So this study I just found as I was uh, going through the literature preparing for this talk, and this was published just a couple of months ago. And this is nice because um, whereas many of the other studies that I've talked about have focused on normal, quote unquote, aging, this focused on patients with mild cognitive impairment. So in this case, these patients all had memory deficits but they're still doing pretty well in everyday life. And so what they did was randomize people to a 12 month program of aerobic exercise, or again, that same stre stretching, toning type of control group. And they had them exercise three to four times a week for 30 to 35 minutes at a moderate level of kind of heart rate. So you get your heart rate up to kind of what is determined a moderate level for your age, and you keep it there for roughly 30 to 35 minutes, three to four times a week. They looked at the, the cognition, the thinking abilities, and different measures of how well the blood is flowing through the body. 
And when they did that, at the, again, they did it at baseline, at six months, and at one year. And when they look at how much resistance was there to blood flowing through our veins, right? When they do that, the groups on the left here, these lines on the left are the control group, the stretching or toning, and the lines on the right are the aerobic exercise group. So with this measure, higher is not good. Higher is showing more resistance to that blood flowing through our veins. Now the thick black line is the group average. These thin gray lines are the individual. So you can see some individuals kind of go down and stay more or less stable. Some go down and come up. And so there's, there's a little bit of fluctuation, but that's why focus on these dark lines here. And what you can see is that the aerobic group showed this steady decline in how much resistance the blood was experiencing over the course of that year. So the blood is flowing much easier at the end of the year than it was at the beginning. And that's not evident in the control group, right? Now, how stiff are the arteries, right? We want the arteries to be able to, to expand and contract pretty nicely. If they can't do that, that's a sign of disease. That's, that's not a healthy sign. And so same thing, the control group didn't change at all. And the exercise group did, and especially in that first six months, right, where we can see this pretty nice steep decline. And then there's a little bit of additional decline over the course of the next six months, but it's more or less stable. Now, theoretically, that means more blood is flowing to the brain, right? In fact, that's what they found. In this case, higher is better. So here you see that there's no change in the control group. But in the exercise group, you do see a significant increase in the amount of blood flowing through the, the vessels. So I thought that this was a, a really nice recent study to kind of highlight one of the ways in which exercise can help our brain. Now, the interesting thing is that these patients didn't um, show cognitive improvement. And why could it be that, you know, this is only a one-year intervention. And if you have, say, 60 plus years of, of other habits that may be counteracting, well, maybe we just haven't followed up long enough. And I think then the question is not just the improvement, but how well can these be maintained? Can we maintain cognitive functioning for longer? So I'll very quickly focus on weightlifting. I, I found this image and I absolutely love it. Um, it actually does a good bit more than I do at this stage of life. So pretty impressed there. So this stage is what's, or this, this study is called what's, uh, it's a meta-analysis. And so what they did is basically take all of these studies that you can see listed here. And I've highlighted basically the minimum was a four week duration up to what, a couple of years, um, more or less of roughly one to three times a week. And when we, they did that, they found that our overall thinking abilities improved. And again, those executive abilities, the, the reasoning, the problem solving, the multitasking, those improved. So we see the benefits, not just with aerobic, but also with more of the anaerobic, the weightlifting, the resistance training. So if we go back to our model of why might we be experiencing things and we think about exercise, which I just love Arnold Schwarzenegger, so I had to have him in here. Can't talk about exercise without talking about Arnold, but you can see that the, that normal aging shrink right? So the contribution of that shrinks with exercise. The contribution of the psychological and social factors shrinks. The medical conditions shrink. And so if we put those all together, we really see this reduction in the risk of dementia that we talked about when I first started this section. And I've also found this study, which was pretty interesting by Shen and colleagues that found that in a large group of people, they just kind of threw a bunch of different um, lifestyle factors into the, the statistical analyses, they found that people who went to the gym and who went to church, that social component, right, had a reduced risk of dementia. So again, hopefully I've given you a sense of, of some of the benefits of exercise and why we may be seeing that. And before, um, and again, I'll just highlight these two uh, questions again, that yes, there are beneficial effects. So one of the things that I'll now transition into and I know that we have probably, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes left. So I want to move over into these areas that, that my group more focuses in and these cognition oriented treatments. So it's kind of a geeky term, right? What does it mean? 
we can think about it as techniques for, in this case, improving how well we learn and remember information. And we have a, a bunch of different approaches that we could use. And I'm gonna walk through each of these different types of interventions that we could do to try and improve our learning and memory. So if we focus on this leftmost column, the rehearsal-based strategies, these are things, basically practice makes perfect. The more times you do something, the better you're gonna know it and the more likely you are to remember it. So there are a number of different techniques that I've listed here, and I'll give you an example of a couple of these coming up, but they basically play around with how we provide that repeated exposure to this information. So the pros of these are that th we know that they can be very successful for teaching specific information. So for example, the name of a new church member, they're very efficient. There are a number of computer programs that are now available to target these different cognitive abilities using some of these same techniques. But the cons are that it's just learning one, say new member of church using these techniques, it's not gonna help you learn the next new member. You're gonna have to repeat the training for each new bit of information you want to learn. And so this is potentially daunting, right? Because we'd have to then apply these same exact repeated exposures. And sometimes it takes hundreds of trials to learn the information. It's very effective, but time consuming. And it may overwhelm kind of what we are able or wanting to do. So one thing that I will mention in this area, and many of you have probably heard the term cognitive training, and there are a lot of different commercial products that, again, the computerized methods make it really wonderful for us. And these can challenge us by using the, the programming, the way the computers are programmed, the programs are programmed, moving the, the difficulty level up and down to make sure that we're challenged. There are a lot of these different ones available. Now, what does the literature say about these? Well, usually they're performed 20 to 60 minutes per day for many weeks on end. And there's very clear benefits that the games that you practice in these programs, you're gonna get better at. It's less clear how well they transfer to our everyday life. There's, there's data starting to emerge that there is some transfer, that we do see things like the executive abilities, that, that multitasking, the planning, that we've talked about uh, before, there is evidence that that does get somewhat better. The duration of training, like I said, it's many, many weeks. And the timing of training, how often should we be doing it? There's a lot of debate about that in the literature where this study in particular looked at all the data that had been acquired and was kind of saying, you know, gosh, it looks like doing it three times a week is probably just fine. So if we can identify those dosing factors, that can help um, get the biggest bang for the buck. Now, one caveat here that I do want to point out is a few years ago, uh, one of these commercial products, uh, you can see this is already about five years old, but Lumosity was had to settle a $2 million um, basically fine because they were having deceptive advertising. And I think at the time they were saying that it, it reduces the risk of dementia and it can uh, really increase the, uh, the resilience of your brain. And they didn't have any evidence to support that. So I want everybody to be very informed consumers that dig into these things. Look at the scientific evidence behind them before you go investing your hard-earned money in doing these things. Now, I'm going to shift to this middle strategy, this uh, external aids. Now, these are things like calendars and notebooks, making lists, using our smartphones. These are things that pretty much all of us do, and we're now very dependent on our phones, right? So no surprise, these things are very common. We know that they're, they'll improve our functioning, um, even if our brain is perfectly healthy. And they're really good for things like future tasks. So I set an alarm when I have to go in and, and um, you know, say, see a patient or sign a note or get a report done. The challenge though, is that sometimes you may not feel comfortable using these things. So for example, if we're in a social situation and I know that if I take a picture of you and I type in your name on my phone, I'm gonna remember it and I can come back to that later. But that's kind of awkward, right? Where if I'm gonna be like, hey, hold on, take a picture. 
if somebody does that to me, I'm going to be a little bit um, confused unless they were to give me that context. And we're not always comfortable giving that context. These methods can be very complex. And again, they're not always appropriate. The longer the time since we say plug things into these, the harder it is to remember, right? Because if I try and remember somebody I met a year ago, and I have 300 additional people, I'm going to be scrolling forever trying to find that information. So again, each of these has pros and cons. One of the techniques that I personally love, the internal strategies, the mnemonic strategies. And I love these because we can give people a rule that can be used anytime they want to learn new information. These strategies also make you think a lot deeper about how you're learning that information. And we, I'll show you some evidence from, from our own work that we can increase the, the way the brain is interacting because we're better structuring this information. It's more organized within our brains. The cons, it is, it's effortful and time consuming. And so if, for example, when I see patients who have slower thought that it's, it's taking longer for things to click, I may not want them to start out with these particular techniques because they are more demanding. And I'd rather perhaps build up how quickly they can process information and then add these in. Sometimes they're more complex than the, than the task demand. So I can, you know, if I, for example, um, when I'm asked to stop by the grocery store and pick up some things, um, I can make a mental list and I can create this beautiful mental movie of me walking through the grocery store but you know what? I'm likely to forget things. So I just have it texted to me and I'll have, I'll walk through with my list and that's the easiest way. So I'm using an external as opposed to an internal approach. And some of our data suggests that, you know, we may not want to use these techniques as the disease progresses, various diseases progress and patients move further into the dementia range. Um, they may just not be as effective. So the best known study here is this active trial, which included almost 3,000, so 2,800 older adults. And this was done uh, now a couple of decades ago. And so what they did was randomize people to either a no contact control group, a processing speed training, a reasoning training, or a memory training. And, and here are the basic results were the processing speed. And you can see that 10 years later, there's still a huge benefit of this processing speed training. Same thing with the reasoning training five years after, huge benefit. At 10 years, it starts to get a little bit closer. But if you think about this being the control group, you're still doing a heck of a lot better than the control group, right? Same thing with the memory. At five years, still beneficial. And the, even though the results were not significant for memory training at 10 years, one of the big factors that I'd like to, to point out is, look, this control group did something really weird. So the memory group is still showing better memory test performance than the other two treatment groups, but something weird happened here. So there's, there's a good bit of evidence that these techniques can be effective, and it seems like they may help people maintain their performance for longer. Uh, Jerry Edwards and colleagues showed a lower incidence rate of dementia in patients who had, at 10 years, in patients who had received this processing speed training. So I know that the group who conducted this initial study has now finished their 20 year follow-up. So it'll be interesting to see how those data come out. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide for the sake of time, but basically saying that these techniques can be beneficial. And just comparing, showing you some data that we have to compare these strategies with this more spaced retrieval. So these rehearsal based techniques where we made people remember information for slightly longer bits of time each trial. Well, when we did that, the strategies, people remembered the information way better, not just after training, but one month later compared to when we gave them just the mere repeated exposure. And the cool thing here is that, remember this frontal parietal cortex that, that I was talking about? We saw an increase in how these areas were um, involved after training in the strategy group. And this also then increased the activation within the hippocampus. So the, net, the hippocampus, remember, critical for learning and memory, was now more active. And these kind of spaghetti-looking type of lines 
show that the hippocampus was now much more integrated. It was communicating better with other parts of the brain. Whereas in the spaced retrieval group, this kind of practice makes perfect approach, we actually saw a reduction in how active certain brain regions were, which you may be scratching your head, but it's basically practice makes perfect, right? That I don't have to try as hard the 15th time I've seen something as I did the first time. And so we see very different effects where strategies seem to restore. And, you know, I think that highlights my own personal bias that the that, that technique does matter. So I'm gonna go through, this is basically just showing that cognitive training can be beneficial in those who have progressed to the dementia stage. And then we've, we've also just recently finished um, a study where we combine mnemonic strategy training with a type of brain stimulation that I'm gonna talk very briefly about here in a minute. And we just finished this study because remember I just showed you the data showing that with the strategies, we were able to increase activation in this brain region. Well, with this electrical stimulation of the brain, we're able to target that area. So we just finished a study where we enrolled 107 people, 98% finished the study at our primary endpoint, and then we had a three-month follow-up, and we had about 87% retention even at that three-month stage. The important thing, though, is that we lost a number of people because of the initial COVID shutdown this time last year, and, and people just weren't able to come in because we weren't able to, to bring them into the office. So our retention actually would have been higher, and we're currently analyzing these data, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see if we can improve the, the effects of the strategy training by pairing it with some of this brain stimulation. So when I talk about brain stimulation, gosh, what am I talking about? Well, one type that we use is called transcranial direct current stimulation. So kind of a geeky term, TDCS. And basically the idea is in the simplest form, you can have two types of electrodes. You have an anode that puts the current into the head. So let's pretend this is the anode. We're introducing the current into the head and the cathode collects the current from the head, right? So this electrode here is putting it in. This one is pulling it out. And electricity needs a circuit, right? So that's why a light bulb turns on because we flip the switch. It allows the electricity to flow through to the light bulb and then back. Um, and so it completes that circuit. This is the same general principle. So there's some interesting effects where when we think about if, if this is the skull, right? So we can see the pads, the electrodes sitting on this individual's head and underneath there are these neurons right? And the neurons are what is actually making us think. So when I'm speaking, when I'm moving my arms, all these neurons are firing in coordination. So what we know is that when we apply the current, we can either make neurons more or less likely to communicate. And so the way that we do this is under this anode, if we have neurons that are kind of sitting along, just kind of hanging out, waiting to, to make a phone call, so to speak, we can then increase the likelihood that they'll do that. And so if we have to get this red line over this, this green line here in order to have them make that phone call, so to speak, well then using the anode, putting the current into the head, we can push it up closer to there. And so we're able to play around with the probability that people are going to uh, be able to engage these brain regions, that we're gonna get these neurons communicating better. And so then we can use some, some kind of cool, geeky MRI uh, approaches to where we can then look at within each individual's brain, how well can we deliver the electricity to where we want in the head? Now, when I say electricity, some people will think, oh, is that shock therapy? Absolutely not. It is not. TDCS uses, literally, we use AA batteries that you put in your, your uh, TV remote or we use nine volt batteries that you put in your smoke detectors. That's as much electrical current as we're using. We're using say a maximum of, of say four milliamps. Electroconvulsive therapy, the shock therapy uses 700 to 900 milliamps. So we're nowhere close and our goals are very, very different. This technique is so far very, very safe. People will report kind of an itching, a tingly, type of feeling on the scalp that goes away as soon as we shut the, the stimulator off. 
There are other types of neuromodulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation that some of you may have heard about um, that, again, for the sake of time, I'm happy to loop back to if there are questions about, but this can actually make the neurons fire. So it's like you're shoving the neurons, you're making them communicate. Whereas that last technique, the TDCS that I talked about is, hey, you should really give your mom a call. And then they make that call, right? Whereas T T TMS is like, hey, I dialed your mom's number, you're making that call. So we're playing with the probability as opposed to TMS forcing the neurons to potentially fire. So the evidence for this, this is an older review, but focusing on patients with dementia of the Alzheimer's type, they found huge benefits. So if you think about most medications being somewhere in the 0.2 effect size range, these are like 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 1.3, they're huge effects. There are a lot of methodologic questions though. And so, you know, certainly not every study has found this level of, of benefit. And these numbers come from all of these figures over here, where if it's on the right side of zero, then each individual study then showed some big effects. But if it's on the left side of zero, there weren't effects, or if it's at zero, there weren't effects. So overall, across all of these studies, there were some really good effects, but that isn't always the case. So some of the goals that my own group is focusing on are, are really these treatment parameters. What do we need to move it from this kind of geeky lab-based setting into real world so that we can get it in the hands of people who will benefit from it? So we're focusing on things like how much should we be giving? Is it at the scalp or should we in integrate some of these MRI-based measures and really focus how much are we giving at your brain? And I think that's going to be the more important piece. How long should we be doing it? Not just for each session, but how many sessions? Should we be doing it for many, many sessions on end? And right now we're up to, you know, somewhere around 30 or so sessions at a time, evaluating the effects of that. Who benefits? How do we go from kind of this group level down to the individualized approach? So these are all things that my group is working on, and we're doing this through one, one of the studies that we currently have going on that I mentioned at the very, very beginning. Stimulation to improve memory is kind of our catchy little acronym or STEM, and we're enrolling individuals who, who are suffering from mild cognitive impairment or early stage dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And we're trying out three different active doses compared to a, a sham condition. We're then using a bunch of different types of neuroimaging so that we can better understand, gosh, why might some people benefit? Why are some people not benefiting? And we're actually then using these kind of, like I said, more geeky MRI-based methods to see how much stimulation is actually reaching each individual's brain. And the hope is that we'll be able to move into a more definitive trial once we've established some of these parameters. So I know we have just a couple of minutes left and I wanted to just take it back real quick down to that individual level where we wanna be able to deliver it. So I thought that I would show you data from a case of a patient that we've worked with now for actually a couple of years. This individual has logopenic primary progressive aphasia. So long mouthful, but basically having difficulty finding the right words. And it's because this particular area of the brain is affected by a disease process. So what we did was to look at some of the, the neuroimaging methods. So in this case, it's a PET scan that some folks in the audience may have had, different measures of MRI. And what we were able to do is identify the part of the brain that was not functioning as well. So you can see that in this case, this is a little bit darker than on this side, right? So it says that this side of the brain is not working as well. Same thing here, this is darker than over here. So again, not getting as much blood flow to the brain. And so we then developed this, where we wanted to put the electrodes so that we could stimulate that particular area of the brain. And we did this in two rounds with the person. This first round we targeted, we took a restorative approach, trying to get that area back functioning better. And you can see, these are the number of words that the, the individual was able to produce over the 30 sessions that we worked with her. And you can see there's a nice increase over the course of these 30 sessions. Well, when we looked at her brain activity, not only did we see more activity, interestingly, in the front of the brain, right? Whereas we're seeing a reduction in the parts of the brain that we targeted. 
But now the brain is changing how it's communicating. We brought the person back a couple of months later and we took a different approach where now we're targeting the preserved areas of the brain, this, this prefrontal cortex here. What we saw was again, a nice increase with the number of words produced over the course of these 30 sessions. But look, she's producing way more words when we target this relatively preserved area than she was in this first round, right? Now we see the pattern of brain activation. Actually now this more dysfunctional area of the brain is more active. And the prefrontal parts that are more active, maybe to compensate, are now calming down. And again, we're seeing the patterns of how the brain is communicating change as a result of where we're stimulating. So this is the, the general summary slide. So uh, certainly these non-medication approaches appear to have benefits. We can see that we are changing the way the brain is working. I think that the type of intervention does matter. And the techniques are, are still going to be important. Even if we find that magic pill that say stops Alzheimer's disease, by the time that pill gets into people's systems, they may have cognitive deficits and still need to benefit from these techniques. So I want to acknowledge my team and the collaborators, the Alzheimer's Center. Um, we have a really great uh, ability to, to bring people from the Alzheimer's Center into this uh, research program and, and again, doing a lot of really exciting things and, and there's a lot of growth that we have um, coming up. So with that, I know we have a few minutes left. So let me pause and see if anyone has questions. Oh, I think you're muted, Daniel. Yep, we do have a few questions. Um, so one of the questions, are these treatments covered by health insurance? So that's a wonderful question. So yes and no. So exercise, certainly, um, you know, you can exercise just right there in your own living room. So um, physical therapy for people who need it would probably be covered and that could be a good way of kickstarting. But I don't know that um, personal trainers, I don't believe that those are going to be covered. I, I don't know if gym memberships are covered, um, but exercise is one of the nice things is we can go out and, um, you know, walk around the road. We can go to a mall. We can um, engage in exercise in many different ways. The cognition-oriented treatments that I was talking about, in fact, um, many healthcare providers do reimburse for these services. And I'm actually trying to develop a clinic at the, all, at the, uh, the University of Michigan to, to help provide these services for people. And, and you know, fingers crossed that we're going to be able to do that. With the, the brain stimulation techniques, that's where, again, it gets a little bit tricky because for cognitive purposes, for thinking abilities, they're not yet approved. And so we're still doing these as part of research studies, trying to build that evidence base to get insurance companies to, to reimburse us. Okay. Um, if increased blood circulation in the brain helps, what about medicines that could increase circulation? So I... You know, I'm certainly, I, I don't prescribe medications. I'm not licensed to prescribe medications. So I have to be careful when I answer this. One of the challenges though, that I do want you to be very, very conscious of, if you take a medication that increases your blood flow, that's probably gonna increase the pressure of that blood pumping through your veins, right? We know that higher blood pressure is likely to lead to strokes and ruptured blood vessels. So um, the hemorrhagic strokes. So talk to your doctor before you start taking any of these supplements that claim to, to you know, increase your, your vascularity or your blood flow. Talk to your doctor, please. Okay. Are there any known sex differences in responsivity to um, TD, excuse me, TDCS or TMS? Yeah, really, really wonderful question. There... I don't know of any. There are certain, you know, the problem is that there are a couple of studies that I'm sure have found sex-related differences, but nobody else has. So if we get these kind of one-off studies, maybe there's something there, but I tend to look for, can we replicate things? And I'm not aware of any specific sex-based differences, um, but I will go into the literature and, and dig around more just to see if that has been covered. And I'll, maybe I'm just not aware of it, but to my knowledge, no. 
Okay. Is your brain stimulation DC or AC? Ooh, that's an awesome question. So we, we can actually do both. So uh, you saw me get really geeky, excited about this and, and uh, please don't mock me, but the, the direct current stimulation, right? This is what, um, uh, if you think about Tesla back in the, the uh, early days with um, Edison and the, the AC DC wars. So direct current, you basically turn it on and it's on until you turn it off. Whereas the alternating current is what Edison won out with because it has this up and down waveform, right? So we can actually do both. We've been focusing on direct current stimulation, but I think with some of that, that future that we're gonna be doing, we are gonna look at alternating current because that allows us to target specific frequencies of communication in the brain that maybe can help people function even better. Okay, and what would you suggest as a first step for seeking evaluation, possible treatment, um, where we notice possible memory speech um, deficits in early parents or family? Yeah, it's, it's such a wonderful question. And I think um, there are a number of things. Certainly, a lot of people will go to your family provider, um, to your, your general practitioner, and seek a referral. For um, I know that the center, and, and Danielle, maybe you have these, or we can certainly make them available to folks, but we've, um, a number of folks in our, our center, um, and Dr. Ron, Ramon Filippiak, and uh, folks in the Outreach Corps have spent a lot of time putting a resource packet together that covers the greater Ann Arbor, Detroit area. And I can't remember how much beyond that we go um, at this point, but we can certainly make those resources available. I think that... Um, if you do have concerns, I would start with your doctor. And if, if you need our help to, to try and help identify um, the best providers, certainly um, feel free to contact us. Yes. Okay. And another one, how can I get my VA, con excuse me, how can I get my VA connected father involved in any of the therapies discussed? Yeah. So, um, I would say maybe reach out to Danielle who can connect you with, uh, connect you to me. Um, I can't promise that we'd be able to offer anything and it depends on, you know, where they live and, and kind of what's going on, but I'm, I'm certainly happy to, to help. I, I think that's one of the, the things again, that I've been um, really trying to, to grow is, is kind of this VA um, integrating our, our veterans um, in these type of studies. So please feel free to reach out. Okay, and one more. Sorry, I'm going through. Are there any games um, that improve mnemonic devices that families buy to work with their um, person with MCI? Yeah, so that's, that's a good one. Um, yeah, there are a lot of different computer programs, um, you know, so I, I mentioned some of the, the more common commercially available ones. Um, there's starting to be more evidence to support those. I think, again, what I want people to do is, is um, dig into literature and, and the best websites and the best products will have peer reviewed publications. So there's scientific evidence that, that others like me or my colleagues have reviewed that will then say, yes, this actually has benefits. Um, you know, and so I think that there's always a fine line where if you have the resources, certainly it's not going to make anyone worse, but I would not want people to sacrifice, um, say car insurance or any other mandatory um, uh, bill in order to, to have these without understanding kind of the, the potential limitations. So there, there are a number of, commercially viable products available. I don't know that any have specific indications for MCI though. Okay, and then the last one, and there are a couple of questions that I do see, but we're running out of time. So I am going to make sure that we answer these questions offline and um, we'll respond to you via email. So I just wanted to put that out there. But the last thing is, how do you get, how do you get considered for a trial and are studies only open to vets? Nope. Um, I, I love veterans. Uh, my father's a veteran, a uh, number of family friends, um, but I, we're, we're all welcoming. So anyone, you know, we're, we're certainly happy to, to chat with folks. 
Um, you know, and, and we have a range of studies. And to be honest with you, um, one of my personal frustrations is that we're turning away more people than we can enroll. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. So we're, we're pursuing additional grants. We're trying to, to build a donor base to help us um, provide these services. I mentioned the clinic that I'm trying to develop. So certainly not limited to veterans, happy to have anyone who's interested. And Danielle, maybe if folks who are interested could reach out to you and then you can kind of triage to, to myself or to yes. um, one of my team. Yes, that'll be great. And again, we'll get back to those questions. Um, I'm taking track of those. There's a couple that we didn't get to. So thank you everyone to, um, for taking the time out and for attending. I did place the link in the chat box for the evaluation. So if you could take the time to complete the evaluation, your feedback is um, great. We appreciate it. And again, if you want to stay in the loop with the center activities, you're welcome to subscribe to our monthly newsletter. And you can also follow us on our social media channels to find out more information. This recording will be available on our YouTube page. So um, give us about a week or so for us to post this video and you'll be able to go back and watch the presentation or share it with someone else. So thank you all again for your time and attention and have a wonderful day and stay safe. Thanks, everyone.